Good morning, everybody. Um, we, we've got plenty of seats up here if people want to take one. Um, we got a lot of people standing back there. I'm Maren Lead at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I appreciate all of you coming out this morning to hear what I think will be a very interesting discussion of how the Strategic Land Power Task Force and its uh, conceptual work has evolved over the last couple of years. The effort was launched uh, formally in 2013, and I think there was a fair degree of uh, confusion about, about what all it entailed, where it would go, um, and so we were very fortunate to be able to get three of the primary uh, folks working it and leading it to come talk about what they've done over the last couple of years and, and how it's evolved. So. Again, uh, I think it'll be a really fascinating discussion. They've, they've got a lot of interesting ideas that are pushing in new directions, so we look forward to exploring those with everybody here today. Um, again, I, I, we've got two people who have been involved in it uh, basically since inception, and then a, a newer member of the team. Um, Major General Bill Hicks is the Deputy Director at the Army Capabilities and Integration, Capabilities and Integration Center. Uh, and, um, he has been involved in, in multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last decade in a variety of different positions. I, I believe, are you the senior strategist in the yes. Army? The senior Army strategist who's actually uh, employed those skills multiple times in multiple contexts, uh, doing strategy, uh, again, both downrange and on the Joint Staff at Joint Forces Command. Uh, he said, uh, helped in that regarding at a great deal down at down at Arctic and Tradoc and um, has a equally distinguished operational career as a command and staff officer in uh, the 101st and the 82nd. Um, so again, a wealth of knowledge and, and sort of one of the thought leaders that helped contribute to uh, the creation of the effort and has been uh, deeply involved in it ever since. Uh, we also have Major General Chris Haas, who's the Director of Force Management and Development at uh, Special Operations Command. He's a, a career Special Operations Officer who's commanded at the group and, uh, and the Command Joint Special Operations Task Force Alpha, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, he's been the Commander of Special Operations Command in Africa um, and the Combined Joint Forces Special Operations Component Command in Afghanistan as well. So he's uh, experienced a number of different uh, iterations of how special operations commands get integrated into larger operations um, and has done uh, those types of operations around the globe. He also has uh, served in staffs, not just at SOCOM, but at the Joint Staff and in CENTCOM and elsewhere. So, And then finally, Brigadier General Kalea, um, who has many hats, as uh, many Marine generals do. He's the director of the Futures Directorate. Uh, he's the vice chief of naval research, and he's also the commanding general of the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab. Uh, he's a career aviator also uh, with both squadron and group command and um, multiple staff positions throughout his career, including at uh, headquarters Marine Corps and in the Office of Secretary of Defense. So a, a wealth of experience and operational uh, experience at, at pretty much everywhere across the defense enterprise that I think has probably played a large role in informing how you all think about what's missing in how we currently uh, conceive of op future operations um, and how the work of the task force and now the two approved concepts that have come out of that effort uh, will evolve and whether there might be future concepts and the like. So uh, I think I'm going to ask General Hicks to talk briefly about the evolution of the task force and its work. And then uh, I believe uh, General Haas is going to talk about the, um, the human aspects of military operations concept that is being developed. And then General Kalea will talk about the uh, joint concept for integrated campaigning, which has now also been approved for further development. So, and then we'll open it up to all of your questions. So again, thanks to all of you. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> first, you'll, you can tell uh, I'm a little bit impaired today. Uh, you do things when you can, not when you want to. So <clears throat> I have to bear with me. The good news is I'll be brief. Okay, I've seen several people here that understand that. <laughs> so 
our uh, fork jars uh, directed us to take those tasks on to look at four things, which are uh, laid out in the handout you have. We have to get after the lessons of the last decade of war. We have to understand uh, better the human aspects of military operations. We have to understand, very importantly, why our operational dominance has not delivered in the way that we expected. And then looking to the future, we have to understand how to raise uh, land power as an instrument that allows our policymakers to achieve those objectives. Okay? The first product uh, of this effort was a white paper. <clears throat> that white paper is also uh, summarized on your handout. Uh, three key points I want to point out. First, these ideas are not well documented in joint doctrine, our policy, or our strategy. Secondly, we have to uh, think differently about how we run operations and we have to focus them on human objectives. Those are the behaviors of our adversaries and others that we wish to change, to influence. And then finally, you can see where we talk about the intersection of land, cyber, and human, and how those feed a velocity of human interaction, which is a trend that is driving events today as we speak. In fact, as I was driving in, I heard a commentator on the radio say exactly that. That says connection is making things very different than the way they used to be. So from that, <clears throat> we have developed two joint concepts that we are in the process of working with uh, the wider community on the human aspect of military operations, and this concept for integrated campaign. And with that, I'll let my uh, partners uh, take it over. Thanks, Bill. So, Dr. Lee, thanks you for hosting this forum. I know you've been working hard trying to get us all together, and everyone has pretty busy schedules. So uh, I know the real substance and importance of this forum is forum is the question and answer session. So again, like Bill, I'll try to be brief and concise in my opening comments so we can get to the Q&A. I'll briefly discuss the and review, and you have the handout, what is the human aspects of military operation concept, and then I'll talk a little bit about why it's important. But right up front, I'd like to talk about you know, why we see value you know, in this current concept. And I, you know, it's, it's our belief and our opinion, as General Hicks mentioned, that our dominance in the traditional domains, land, sea, air, space, and, you know, hopefully soon to be in cyber, has not achieved the strategic results that we desired or anticipated. And the HAMO concept provides value in that it arranges for joint operations, a different approach really founded and centered on the criticality and the centrality of humans in warfare. And we're going to do this by a unique process of consistently analyzing what we see as the elements that affect human behavior. So the social, cultural, physical, psychological, and informational elements that affect human behavior, and continually analyze those before, during, and after operations so that we're better positioned to achieve our operational and strategic objectives. So right up front, that, that's where we see the value of this concept. So what it is right now is that it's going to inf attempt to describe for the joint force 
and help for the joint force help comprehend and ultimately influence or leverage the behavior of the local populations, the groups, the tribes, the key and relative, relevant actors that occupy our operational space, our operational area. So that right up front is what it, it attempts to help inform and to help leverage. So currently we are working on a review of current doctrine that addresses some aspects, some human aspects of military operations, while also focusing on where are the critical gaps that exist in the human aspects of military operations. And then as we move forward, you know, our, our intent is to get this concept approved. And then once that, uh, that's improve, approved, then what you'll see is a concept that informs the employment of existing and emerging capabilities uh, across the, our services and our combatant commands, as well as identify the new capabilities, competencies, and disciplines that are required to operate inside what SOCOM is describing the, the human domain. In order to increase, this, increase our chances of tactical, operational, and strategic success. So uh, why, why is this important? Well, we've learned over recent operations that uh, our dominance in the other domains hasn't achieved those effects that we've desired. You know, we look at our unfamiliarity with the societies and cultures that we're operating in and with, and we discover that we aren't anticipating the challenges. We aren't anticipating the reactions or actions of the local populations to our military operations and activities. And that this all leads, unfortunately, to our inability to affect really important partnerships and also leads to our inability to garner the support of local populations, key leaders, tribes. Ultimately, we, we end up wasting time and resources during our operations and campaigns because the, this lack of familiarity with the culture and the societies that we're working in and amongst. So again, our, this concept will move towards <coughs> helping the joint force understand what is required and what needs to be institutionalized across all of our, our services to address these specific aspects to increase our chances of strategic success. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks. So uh, General Clea, I think if, if the human aspect of military operations concept is uh, designed to help address a, a conceptual and an operational shortcoming, the integrated campaigning one is, I think, more focused on uh, changing the nature of how we conduct campaigns at, a, at a broad level. So if you could talk a little bit about that concept. Well, certainly, and thank you for the introduction. Again, hosting us, uh, it has been a long time coming. Uh, they're definitely connected. Uh, as for background, uh, December of last year, the Joint Concept General Officer Steering Committee <coughs> endorsed the joint concept for integrated uh, campaigning, um, or what I call JCIC. Uh, some people call it your kick, call it what you want. It's acronym. The, uh, the, the concept will transition the conceptual research that the Strategic Land Power Task Force uh, has done into, into joint development, as been, uh, has been discussed. And the, the, the membership up here are the co-sponsors for the concept and obviously are endorsing are you know, highly endorse its intellectual uh, development, which is where we're at right now in the beginnings of that. Um, the premise of the concept is to provide a more comprehensive approach to campaign planning. So what does that mean? I think we've looked back at the lessons learned from the last 15 years or so of conflict, and we recognize that our adversaries 
are pursuing advantages at the tactical, operational, even strategic level in the areas of the range of military operations that are peaceful, non-kinetic, left of the boom, if you will. And so this concept that recognizes that looks to take a better approach at campaign planning, which has traditionally been very focused on the kinetic side of the spectrum, and looked at the left side of the spectrum, in my opinion, as just a means to get to that next phase, not so much a detailed view or analysis of it. And so in that sense, HAMO is a, is a good part of that, uh, as, as uh, General Haas just talked about. Um, so what the concept will do is it'll provide the joint force uh, a, a new approach to campaign planning that'll link operations simultaneously and in depth across all domains, functions, and really across the entire range of military operations. It'll seek to, um, it'll seek to mitigate and even prevent conflict by now focusing as much on phase one, two operations, phase zero, phase one, two operations as it has in the past with the kinetic operations that everyone is familiar with, phase three and beyond. The, I think it's uh, because of the adversary's new approach to trying to gain advantages and leverage that area that's left of the bang, um, we'd be we'd be ill-informed and, and we wouldn't be preparing ourselves properly in the, in the action of campaign planning if we didn't address that. Um, but it's not to say that it's a shift in focus to that area only. It's, it's important to understand that the other, the other side of the Romo is just as important to be involved in the campaign planning as it has in the past, but now we're just opening the scope and it's, it's a new awareness of what we've been overlooking, if you will, in those earlier phases of, of, uh, of, of, of warfare, if you will, uh, left of the boom, as I said. So um, in summary, and we'll get to questions on this, because I think it's important to talk through it. Um, joint uh, concept for integrated campaigning really looks to leverage all of the capabilities of the joint force um, to uh, address those areas of the range of military operations that we haven't looked at in detail enough in campaign planning. And we see a lot of opportunity in those earlier phases of the range of military operations to fold into detailed planning so that we can prevent conflict. And we see that that opportunity exists to do that long before kinetic operations even begin. Um, so I hope, I hope that makes sense to you and I look forward to talking through that with you and with uh, answering your questions. Okay, well, I will uh, exercise the prerogative of the chair and start with a couple of questions, but then open it up to you as quickly as possible. I, I was remiss in failing to mention if people could turn off the ringers on their phones. Uh, I'd appreciate it. And then when we get to questions, we'll have folks come around with microphones. If you could briefly identify yourself and, and then ask your question, I'd appreciate it. Um, so let me start with a question about the JCIC um, and whether there's the potential as you develop it further. Um, I, you know, there's long been a conversation about the phases and whether the phases reflect reality and all the rest of that. Um, is there the potential uh, in the future that, that this might lead to a reconceptualization of phases? Is the phase construct still hmm. helpful? Yes. <laughs> but yes, you, you, Next yes, it, yes. It, it will change. It will change. Yeah. Okay. What we've seen is uh, phases have been, you know, sequential. Right. Linear. Yeah. And, you know, as we looked at uh, OIF, we saw that the phases were kind of inclined, and you could cut through two or three of them at a right. time. When you look at Yemen, you look at the Russian operations in Crimea. You look at how China is operating in the South China Sea, the phases are vertical. And they are taking action in all phases in the same space. We are not currently aligned that way intellectually, and we have to change that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so to, I want to pull the thread a little bit on the, the human aspects concept and, and ask, um, is, is the fundamental issue, because in theory, 
you know, we've all been, you've all been taught throughout your careers that it's all about, uh, about affecting the behavior of people and decision makers at the end of, at the end, uh, that's the strategic objective mm -hmm. always. It, is, it, is it a change in the theory or a change in our failure to uh, actually behave in a way consistent with that objective? Has the objective changed or has, or we just haven't realized it? Well, well, you know, obviously it's not a bold new idea. Mm, right. Warfare being you know, a clash of wills and wanting to influence the action and behavior, not only of your adversary, deter him, right. defeat him, but also the local population. But what we see is across uh, uh, our entire enterprise, a different approach, no set doctrine that addresses how we will uh, address the elements that affect human behavior and then incorporate that into our planning processes. Each one of the services uh, essentially has a, a different approach to this. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> this, this effort is to you know, more broadly in, uh, institutionalize a comprehensive approach, you know, by phases if necessary, this, the elements that affect human behavior, so commanders are uh, addressing this th throughout their operations. And, and the hope is we're, you know, while we're in the shape phase, if we're addressing these, these elements correctly and incorporating them into our planning process and our activities, is that we, we can potentially stem the tide from moving into later phases of the operations. I think from uh, the Marine Corps' perspective, it's, it's not new as well. Uh, the human endeavor has been part of our doctrine since 1989. And I, uh, I think the way General Haas puts it is, is important to pull out here is that while it's been recognized, I don't think it's been uh, appropriately emphasized, especially in the lower ends of, uh, of the spectrum. I think a lot of times we react to the human aspect or the human endeavor as it pertains to military uh, conflict rather than being proactive and folding it in to the detailed planning that needs to come up front. Uh, I mean, we would just take, for example, you know, General Wallace's comment after we went into Iraq, this was not the enemy that we war-gamed or templated against. So. Within this, this concept would be kind of addressing some of those areas that we missed in those initial campaigns. Two, two examples. Uh, Kosovo, okay. <clears throat> lots of physical action, bombing tanks, no effect. We did a cloning network analysis. So Milosevic's, you know, his human network we started hitting things that they care about, behavior changed. Conversely, in Iraq, a textbook physical operation, hit every target, hit every objective, 19 days on Baghdad, and then we're there for seven years. Why? Because we did not understand the human aspect. Um. Let me ask it. And, and just to add on, so we, you know, we see the the, the Hamo concept being, you know, I think, really key to mm -hmm. achieving some synergy across all the domains. Mm -hmm. You know, with the humans being the the centrality of warfare and conflict. That as we work on doctrine to further refine what the cyber domain is, and and SOCOM is working mm -hmm. on our own doctrine regarding the human domain to more broadly you know, expand on, on that concept is that this, this concept will, will provide synergy and threads and connectivity between all the domains as we go, which I think leads in and, and assists in the further development of our integrated campaigning concept. So it's ideas, it's mindset, it's the, the noun to our Strategic Land Power Task Force and the integrated concept is kind of the verb to our Strategic Land Power Task Force. Uh, mm. Let me ask one last question before opening it up about um, 
the role that uh, that other players are going to have in the evolution of, in particular, the HAMO concept, because clearly intelligence capabilities are implicated in that, as 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 are diplomatic and others. So, so what role are those communities playing in the evolution of your concept? Well, I cer I certainly think that it's a platform, it is a vehicle, it's a it's a a key. Uh, entryway for us to expand our planning and consideration within the interagency intergovernmental. And so as we as we move forward and further refine this concept, you know, we will see opportunities and I think our our partners within the State Department and other agencies will see this review of the elements that affect uh, human behavior and identify with them and say, hey, you, we can we can join and, and cooperate here on the way ahead. You know, the, the current existing doctrine on, on this re really is, remains in kind of the humanitarian assistance and mm -hmm. psychological operations. And that's only addressed in some aspects of it. So this, this broadens the scope of thinking, expands the invitation out to our, our partners in the interagency. So the, I think what's important is both concepts will have a wide range of contributors, okay? So this is not being developed just by us. We've, we've got a very uh, wide tent. Uh, yeah, the, the, these, I, these committees will be yeah. representative of, the, of across DOD. Right. And I think that's why it was critical for both of these concepts to be um, endorsed by the Joint Staff and to get that prospectus uh, and folded, well now the J7, into our efforts to flush out these concepts and to um, implement them. Mm -hmm. and, and when that happens, you will see all the, the other players, as you put it, mm -hmm. come in and reshape it, refine it, and truly, <coughs> truly make it a, an effective joint concept. Okay. Um, okay, we've got lots of questions. So here, and then here, and then up here, and, and then over here. <laughs> Let's get started. <laughs> Um, Jeff Dunn with Sage Guild. Thank you for being here today, and um, I'm, I'm excited about the HAMO concept and the, and the task force. My question is two part. One is, what academic research is DOD is being brought in? 40 or 50 years of crisis decision making literature led by March and others. Sense making and sense giving, Carl White, Catherine Sutcliffe, high reliability organizations, high velocity organizations. W or are we just dusting off Clausewitz and Sun Tzu and, and writing a new concept? Um, and if those are already being incorporated, where's the evidence based research there? And if not, um, where does somebody like ourselves go to participate in the process and, and be helpful? Thanks. Okay. So I would tell you that uh, within the limits of our staff, we have cast a wide net, um, including uh, leveraging some very old bookings work uh, on conflict, a uh, very similar study. And if you want to participate, stand up. <laughs> Here's your guy. And yeah. Tim, raise your hand in the back there as yeah. well. So we have a team here in Washington that We'll be happy to take your name and make you part of the team. Okay. I thank you for not quoting Clausewitz, Jeff. <laughs> Good morning, Colonel Scott Sanborn. I'm the Army Fellow at the Center for New American Security. I think it ties into the the first question. It goes to General Haas's comment about uh, war is a, a clash of wills. And, and my question is whether the effort is going to try and develop metrics to measure will, whether that be our adversaries, different actors on the battlefield, uh, our coalition partners, and even the American people to be able to see the conflict out and whether that ties into the integrated campaign plan. Thank you. So the, the question is, will it develop metrics for success? For, the, for success? To measure the will. Uh, mm. The concept is right now, it, you know, in, in its development, so we haven't clearly 
developed any you know, additional metrics. Once we get the concept approved through the, our, our joint staff process, then we'll look at all the DOTMO PF potential changes that are required in order to institutionalize and inculcate this into our enterprise. So I think at that stage of the actual development process of the, of the joint concept, we'll we be looking at you know, metrics, measures of effectiveness, how, you know, how do we evaluate and, and, and gauge how we're influencing and, and, uh, and leveraging uh, the populations, groups, tribes, et cetera. And, and I think, sir, go ahead. I think, I think as it pertains to integrated campaigning, what I alluded to earlier in my opening remarks, I think the best metric is going to be preventing that conflict, is understanding those early phases and, and doing the detailed planning that mitigates or prevents uh, the kinetic piece to the range of military operations. The success ultimately will be showing up in an, in an environment and not being surprised at what you encounter, as was alluded to earlier as well, sir. Yeah, I, the key thing I would say is in, in our initial war gaming, we did consider the issue of will. You know, do we have an answer? No. Have we engaged people who have done work? Yes. Will we continue that? Yes. The key thing with the concepts, excuse me. The key thing is we have to get, as I said, this is not well represented in doctrine, okay, policy or strategy. So the first thing we have to do is get all the players around the table so that they begin to start thinking about it and it becomes their idea. So we'll get there, but not tomorrow. Okay. okay, so I think up here, and then we'll come back around. So, go ahead. Good morning. Mary Cornell, Army Science Board. Um, many before you have, have uh, looked at this issue, so, and you all have seen what's worked and what hasn't worked. What do you see as the major obstacles to being successful in integrating this concept and into the system? Well, I think initially, the, certainly for the HAMO concept that we originally entitled, you know, working more towards the human domain, was the concern, particularly now in a fiscally constrained environment, that our concept would lead to material solutions that would cost uh, the services a lot of money, that, or that it would potentially change you know, the professional military education of our office. That, you know, and, and we see these as low cost solutions right now within the HAMO concept, but initially that was really in wake of the creation or the establishment of the cyber domain where there was now the establishment of a cyber command, all the services contributing to that. So there was some reluctance and concern that, oh, we establish a human domain, now there's gonna be a human domain command and <laughs> new organizations associated with it and a myriad of uh, material solutions that would have to be applied. So I think we're moving beyond that and. Certainly, the, the fact that it was uh, approved by the joint staff and moving forward is recognition that that's, that's not where we're going with the, with the concept. But, it, but it's still a concern and it's still out there. Uh, yeah, I, I think culture mm -hmm. is your, is your uh, hurdle, your challenge. Um, and so this process, which will be very agonizing and slow, uh, is key to getting it past that point. And so when we say that the uh, steering committee approved it, that's all the combatant commands, all the services, which is important. And then they and others will contribute to the development of these two concepts. So at the end of the day, they own it. And then we can transition to doctrine and, and on, okay? So I think that's an important point, the culture piece. Um, Look, we all, the services are different. They all have different perspectives. I have a different perspective on the human endeavor as a Marine. I have a different perspective on land power as a Marine. 
But, as an aviator. And as an aviator. <laughs> But, but the point is you have to get past that and look at the, the higher goal of what we're accomplishing here. And what we alluded to earlier about changing the phases of, of comp, I mean, if you don't get through the cultural barriers, that'll never happen. I mean, it'll never happen. Understanding what the goodness is that comes out of the back end, seeing what we've been deficient in, deficient in in the past and addressing and being reactive to, you gotta put your perspectives aside and, and go after it as a joint force. And there might have been some misunderstandings regarding the, the nature of the Strategic Land Power Task Force and then the development of these concepts that it was somehow in a counter to air-sea battle or, you know, our alternative or a different approach to that, which it is not. It's certainly the HAMO concept right. would absolutely complement and, and enhance air-sea battle, so. Right. In fact, I would add, <clears throat> on the integrated campaign, one of our uh, strongest allies has been the Navy. Because mm. when you think about it, I mentioned South China Sea, and you talk to them about that, they're like, you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're, we're playing checkers, okay? Sorry. <laughs> and they're playing chess, chess, okay? So that's the issue. Yeah, Dave Ralston, uh, CGI. Hey, thanks first for your service. It's uh, greatly appreciated. Um, about 10 years ago in a room.
General Hicks said, with the services and the geographic combatant commander representatives sitting around the team and these joint development teams, we're, we're addressing those right now. But obviously our, our goal in end state is it, it moved much, much beyond just a, hey, here's your, here's your checklist for this phase of the operation. <clears throat> Add anything it's a mindset change. Yep. Hi, good morning. Megan Eckstein with Defense Daily. Uh, the documents that you provided for us kind of drive home the point that you know warfare is about personal interactions and not just amassing weapons, but we do obviously bring a lot of equipment into the battlefield. So I wonder if it's clear yet, um, you know, if there's anything we're doing either with the equipment that we're bringing in or how we use it that might be detrimental to these early phases, um, and if there's anything that we should be doing differently or any way that you might research how to kind of use the equipment better to achieve the um, results that you want. So I, I would give you an example of an action we did take that was detrimental because of the mindset. So when we did the target list for Iraq, <clears throat> and that campaign was, you know, from a physical standpoint, executed very well. We hit a bridge out in Anbar province. That bridge connected a phosphate fertilizer plant <clears throat> to Nineveh, the breadbasket of Iraq. So as we went into the plant uh, planting season, <clears throat> no fertilizer. That bridge was of no military Significant, it was irrelevant. <clears throat> Moreover, it had no effect on Baghdad. The government, the army, Saddam, is irrelevant. But we hit it because that's what we do. We have to change that idea. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that the HAMO concept mm -hmm. will attempt to address. Okay, so what is the the impact? How how is this going to motivate or alienate? not only the, the local population, but certainly our adversaries. So I'll give you an ex another example for in Afghanistan. So our partners from the United Arab Emirates, early on in their introduction and support to, to our campaign, wanted to bring in armored vehicles and heavy tanks, particularly when we partnered with them and they moved with us into the Helmand region. And our lack of understanding or our miscalculation of, oh my gosh, we're bringing in tanks, you know, the Afghans will think it's the Soviet Union all over again. And what we try to describe for uh, at, at that time was, well, these are, these are Muslim tanks. These are UAE tanks. These aren't U.S. tanks. I mean, these will be welcome. I mean, the local population will see this as a, as a force for protection. These aren't infidel tanks that are arriving on the battlefield. These are you know, they're fellow Muslims that are working very hard to uh, defend and protect them. And we just, you know, we, we couldn't kind of get beyond uh, or get down to the real keen, in-depth understanding of how this would be perceived by the local populations and how it would be perceived by, obviously, the, the Taliban or other adversaries, which was, whoa, there's, you know, the coalition just introduced some new firepower in the battlefield. We got to relook our tactics. Maybe we're going to change where we're going to be. So uh, we are always considering that. But I think the Hamo concept will, will help. help contribute Absolutely. to those decisions. It's a, it's a tough question, Megan. And I'll tell you what: um, uh, the uh, example that General Haas just talked about with armored vehicles, the uh, the IED threat is global. It's not just in Afghanistan and Iraq. I asked the French about their endeavors in Mali. And, it, and it's not one that you can react to, the IED threat. You have to be prepared to, for that when you go into an area. So there's going to be a balance. And hopefully with an awareness and an education of early on planning for that uh, through the HAMO concept and JCIC, uh, we'll have better solutions going forward. I'm going to work my way back around the room. We've got some more back on this side. Uh, thank you very much. I am uh, Dr. Nisar Chaudhary with the Pakistan American League. Uh, you mentioned about human behavior. At culture, one single element is not enough. One needs to know the history of that group, that nation, those tribes. 
their traditions, their values, their thought process, their attitude, and their approach. And what are their perceptions uh, uh, about the Western world? That's very important to understand. Because we look at them through the lens of American lens. We need to also look at them, how they look at us. Mm -hmm. So uh, like in Iraq, when the, the forces went in, they went in as liberating forces, actually. But not, it did not take a long time before the local population started perceiving them as an occupying forces. And uh, for the first time, I enjoyed this term also. I had heard before the Islamic bomb, but I had never heard before the Muslim tank. That was a good term. That <laughs> <you used. laughs> so my question is that uh, since uh, this uh, extremism, militancy, fanatism, and uh, uh, terrorism, it's a common enemy of mankind, humanity, and every religion. Is there a strategy where uh, the Western democracies and industry nations can incorporate OIC as well, since it's a common enemy, and come up with giant forces to deal with this across the globe. Uh, because uh, this enemy is a faceless enemy, doesn't draw battle lines. <coughs> and is there any special strategy to deal with them? Or will the world be just working as firefighters and reacting to what they're doing? Thank you very much. So if I can abstract that and rephrase it a little bit, I, I think essentially, uh, uh, would application of the HAMO concept uh, affect how we conduct counterterrorism uh, and, and uh, deal with the threat of Islamic extremism? So, so Is that I would, a fair? I would, I would say it will affect how we do all operations. Mm -hmm. And, and draw the two concepts together. As we engage and build partnerships, we will develop a network of uh, armies and other forces, particularly those that uh, special ops work with, who are more capable of dealing with problems at the local and regional level. And that will allow us to do a better job collectively of managing this problem. <clears throat> but to take it a step further, if you think about, again, Iraq, <clears throat> we spent 10 years looking at Iraq after there's a storm. And we counted everything on the battlefield, but we didn't understand Iraq. And importantly, we did not understand Saddam. There is a book, Iraqi Perspectives, that's out. You can get it off the internet. <clears throat> and if you read that, you'll understand that Saddam's number one problem was Iran. His number two problem was Israel. His number three problem was the Arab world. His number four problem was controlling his own uh, leaders in the country. And so we were number five on the list. We were not number one. So when you think about why did he deceive us <clears throat> about weapons of mass destruction, it's because he was worried about keeping Iran at bay, Israel at bay, maintaining his position in the Arab world, and being seen by his leaders as a top dog. He would not have done that if he had said, oh, I don't have weapons of mass destruction. But we did not understand that. <clears throat> and the rest, as they say, is history. Okay. Can we go uh, over there, and then over there, and then back there? So. Thank you. Leandra Bernstein, Sputnik International News. Um, I had a question, first of all, very simple. What exactly is the timeline for implementing this concept? And then uh, in the near term, the United States is going to have an increased rotational presence in Eastern Europe uh, with, the, with the NATO uh, rapid response forces. And I'd just like, like it if the panel could sort of troubleshoot how, uh, how, this, how your concept could play into uh, US, US operations with NATO in the, the current conflict with Russia. <clears throat> uh, 
she's talking specifically about HEMO uh, well, or so integrated there, I campaign. Think, I think both concepts. Does your question refer to both concepts or, or, or just in particular the human aspects? Okay. So the well, timeline. I also think it. it okay. So you can answer the, uh, it with both. Integrated campaigning uh, as well, but so the timeline, uh, the implementation the timeline is has not been set. Yeah. So. As long as it takes. Historically, we're looking at you know what another year, mm -hmm. two years, to, and then you know, since this has got to be ingrained <coughs> in the service and GCC culture, it, it's going to take some time. So we, we see these thing, these concepts maturing and being fully adopted over essentially a fight it, <clears throat> so about five years. I think it absolutely will, will contribute to our contributions to, to NATO. And we have many arrangements and many institutions <coughs> that exist between our doctrinal uh, and schoolhouses and, and NATO, where we can also share this, these ideas and this mindset and this concept with our, our NATO partners and allies. So I think it goes beyond NATO, obviously, the, the concepts. My, I, I see great value in both concepts and, and how it will affect our theater security cooperation efforts globally. We have forward deployed forces all over the place trying to prevent conflict, trying to get that upper hand in the phase zero uh, operations. And by enhancing and informing their actions, um, I think it'll have an impact on, on those efforts. Do you think that if we were to fast forward five years to the full implementation of the concepts, mm -hmm. uh, would it affect? Uh, would it affect? Would it, would it imply changes to how we might be approaching the Russia problem today? Yeah, I think it's informing sure. how we're approaching it right now. At mm -hmm. least the, the work and the study and the research that uh, the Strategic Land right. Power Task Force has done thus far is right now contributing to ideas, concepts, as we look at what's going on in Ukraine, Crimea, and the rest of the region. Yeah, and, 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 and other regions. And, and we're go we'll bring that to certainly SOCOM in, in our participation in upcoming uh, planning events that address this will bring these ideas, these concepts uh, to the table for consideration. Okay. So it's already being implemented yeah, to we're some not, degree. <coughs> yeah, we're not going to wait. Informing your inputs formal in different, right. Yeah, okay. we, we've ex exposed the idea to a wide range of people in war games, seminars, concept development, uh, engagement with uh, folks in, in the uh, DC area. Mm -hmm. So there are many people who have been exposed and we hope infected. <laughs> Inoculated. Yeah. Both ideas. The HEMO and the... The, the idea is centrality to the human aspect and the requirement to change how we plan and execute uh, campaigns. Um, okay, I, I neglected to mention too, for people who are watching us on the internet, if you want to email questions, you can email them to me at mlead at csis.org and I will inject them. So here and then there, and then we'll go over here. So right here, up, there we go, yeah. Uh, Tom Oakley, representing myself. Um, so how are you careful not to position the military at solving problems that A, it shouldn't solve, and then B, staying out of sort of the development uh, defense uh, kind of concept that, that hasn't really worked, and that sort of leads a little bit into coin. So just trying to make sure that this is not sort of rehashing of the past and putting the military in a position where it becomes a tool to try to solve problems that eventually it can't solve, especially in the development world. Well, uh, you know, certainly how the, how we're employed is made at the highest levels you know, in, the, in the White House and by senior policymakers. So these efforts are about being able to provide more informed options to right. 
our policymakers. And so if, if we do this right and we uh, adopt you know, some of the, the real <coughs> gems uh, of both HAMO and integrated campaigning, then the military or the uniform service would be in a much better position to provide options for our policymakers and right. in, in how they employ us and provide them, you know, our best, again, best military advice on what's the best way to utilize us. The other thing I would say is we don't get to choose what we do, okay? And over, you know, 300 years, we have been uh, successful and unsuccessful in a variety of different uh, conflicts, right? So we have to broaden the options for, for our uh, policymakers. And I would note that you can use the military instrument in a variety of different ways. And if you think about Latin America and the general change in the attitude of that military uh, in each of those countries, a lot has to do with the fact that we have been engaged with them for now, what, about 40 years in very uh, small but important ways, okay? So I, I'm, I'm not one to dismiss or, or to uh, diminish the role that we can play in what is a wider civil issue, like changing the political dynamics of a country where the military you know, may be a junta, and over time you can change that. I think, uh, but it takes a long view. You know, Colombia is a great example of long-term, uh, very focused military effort as part of a wider campaign. And I think that you, know, you ought to call that a win, right? right. I, I think it's a big win. Small effort. Yeah, small, small effort. effort. But the people you're using there are the product of a big army and a big Marine Corps. I mean, it's not, you know, those folks are colonels, you know, senior leaders. Not, yeah, I'm sorry. They, they are uh, products of an army development process when they are, you know, 05s and 06s that come in and they got, I have credibility and I'm, help, I'm here to help you. And over time, you see that change. And that's what's important, okay? I would just tag on to what General Haas said, and it's a, a, about providing options to senior leaders, providing those options earlier, and providing those options in a manner that's less focused on kinetic options and more to mitigate and prevent having to talk to those kinetic options that we are, our current campaign planning is so focused on. Yeah, so it's an oversimplification. Say we're just a, a big bad hammer in, in the toolbox of national strategy. Yeah, we can be much more than that, as as General Hicks was saying. And you know how we present those options of being more than just the phase three hammer that that comes in and does things is what uh, this endeavor, the Strategic Land Power Task Force, has been all about. Here and then go over there and then back there and then over there. So, no, no, sorry, I'm sorry, but there's a bunch of people in front of you. So now I'm, we had a whole bunch of simultaneous hands. I worked my way through those. Now we're going sequential. So, Doug Morrison, uh, defense consultant uh, here in DC. I I got to pull on this strategic thread again, especially uh, maybe General Hicks and General Haas because of your comments that you just made, and I understand the options. Uh, and I'm glad that we've put the clash of wills on the table and the fact that war is, is politics by another means. But uh, my experience over the last 15 years or so, um, the, the three of you have been pretty hard on yourselves about how effective you've not been. And I heard a senior leader, and this is not meant to be political, so it cuts across the spectrum. I heard one political leader say in 2003 that I'm really not interested in providing the municipal water supply of Los Angeles or Chicago to Iraq. Uh, I'm not interested in uh, rebuilding 
X. Uh, you know, again, the perception of, of what the human population in Iraq required, or the fact that we, uh, on one hand, wanted to keep the Iraqi army employed and potentially deployed, and then dismissed them all. A, po a political decision, raise the discussion to the strategic and political level. How is the concept going to help educate those non-uniformed members so that you don't take options off the table on public television and tell an adversary what you're not going to do? Uh, or uh, believe that a foreign leader, uh, Crimea, um, does not see that the world environment has completely changed and that actions or inaction have consequences across the entire campaign and, and the military tool is only one part of the toolbox. Because if we're truly going to execute these two concepts, it's, it's not just the military element of power. It, it, it's a lot bigger than that and the concepts, if we're going to be successful with them in my view, are going to have to educate those, those senior civilian leaders, potentially. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Well, when I'm the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, I'll answer that question on influencing <laughs> the national policy makers. But to get your point about, hey, I'm not interested in the waste treatment or the of Iraq. Well, we are actually working on, through our Institute of Military Support to Governance, a capability that exists within our Civil Affairs Reserve National Guard community that will identify those experts that we can tap into and actually bring forward to, to bring true expertise in what are not our traditional military activities to <clears throat> enhance the, the activities of our, of the State Department or USAID, <clears throat> et cetera. So we are working on that, even though we may not potentially uh, like to apply a lot of uh, energy and resources to it. We, we recognize that that's, that we might be called upon to do it. So within the special operations community and certainly within the Army special operations community, we're working on, on just that, that area. So <clears throat> I think the, the, the HAMO concept, again, helps contribute to and, and provides you know, real justification of why we need to apply, going back to resources, more resources and, and some funding to these efforts so that we have an ability, when we talk about options, to right. our <clears throat> to the National Command Authority that they're, they're backed up with <coughs> capabilities. Yeah. Policy is not our space. Uh, options, not ultimatums, is. And military advice is. The development of these concepts will, as I said, involve a wide range of people. So from an education and exposure standpoint, I think over time, you know, we hope to see more people uh, think uh, more thoughtfully about these ideas, and particularly those in civilian life, think tanks and elsewhere, who come in and out of government, um, <clears throat> that uh, they take that on board. But at the end of the day, elected and appointed officials make policy. So. Our job is to give them as many options as possible. Okay, I think uh, we had right here. Not, he was he's had his hand up for a while. Andrew Davies, right there. Hi, morning. Abuma Smith from Noetic Corporation. Uh, just turning to General Kalea's comments about uh, how phase zero may actually be the the time when we can really make some traction with this uh, this concept. Uh, and we've already acknowledged that some of the most effective levers that might be pulled in phase zero are not actually military ones, but the ones that are, are commanded by other elements of government. First question, we started to deal with this. Um, have we started to engage the rest of government on this concept to bring them on board with it is the first one. And the second point is the best military lever that might be pulled at an early phase might not be an American one, it might be an international one or a partner who has better access in a particular area. How do you internationalise the concept potentially? 
Well, um, okay. So the first part of your question was, have we opened this up to other parts of the government in our agency? I don't think that either concept really addresses a change to the current relationships that we have in the interagency and how we work. I think it's more for within inside the Department of Defense and the Joint Forces to have a better understanding about the effectiveness of operating on the left side of the bank better than we do today. Um, and I think that there'll be a natural um, uh, growth to the effectiveness of that coordination with the interagency. And the second part of your question was, oh, international. Um, it's going to translate uh, to, to international cooperation just the same. We, we have been doing joint war games with the international community on this idea for, for some time now, uh, with the international community, with partners, with allies. Um, uh, cer certainly, the relationships that are established uh, from my perspective, would allow that certain partner or ally to take the lead and have a coalition uh, come together to effectively address situations in, in that manner. So, yeah, I, I would say you know one example is the fact that our theater commands now, army commands, all have uh, multinational officers as a deputy. Mm -hmm. That's a deliberate uh, decision. In fact, in the PACOM, we have a. Uh, uh, U U.S. Army Africa's deputy is in Australia. So we're starting to do that right now to make those connections and to have <clears throat> our actions reinforce and enable non-military elements of uh, our government. Okay? We can <clears throat> we provide a carpet for them to move on. And that's part of what we have to do particularly as an army. This is part of our responsibility. Do you want to say anything? No? Okay. Well said. Uh, so right back there in the middle. Thank you. Um, Richard Figueroa, student. Uh, you said earlier, or it was said earlier, that the military is no longer just a hammer. I was wondering where the role of something like the Peace Corps would be in uh, informing our uh, perception of uh, other countries or other countries and communities' perceptions of Americans in general before uh, we go to the ground with troops or anything like that in the future? I think it's a valuable tool and resource. Prior to going into <clears throat> Afghanistan in 2001, you know, we sent out kind of a blanket all call find anyone that's ever operated, worked with uh, Mujahideen, not just obviously inside our, our Central Intelligence Agency, but, but elsewhere to come in to, certainly my organization at the, at the time, the, the Face Special Forces Group, to give us a better understanding of what we're going to see on the ground. You know, what are you know, some of the key tenets that we don't want to be violating right up front. And so, you know, there was a, I remember there, and we did the same thing before we went into Iraq. And there was, you know, our multinational partners, you know, some from uh, NATO, some from uh, non-NATO countries that were able to come in, and some were former NGOs that had worked and provide us a, a unique perspective on what, what we could expect uh, culturally and from specific groups that we would be working with. So I see that, you know, absolutely a tapping in it mm -hmm. into the Peace Corps and other experts with, they're really culturally attuned or cultural experts. And uh, again, the HAMO concept should be you know, addressing that. Yeah. I, I would just say Peace Corps and military <coughs> are not in competition, they're complementary, especially in in the you know kind of gray or white space of of peace as it exists today. And what the Peace Corps tries to do, and others, USAID, etc., is more effective in countries where there is stability and rule of law. So. You know, and unfortunately, in some countries, that's provided by the military more than civil police and that sort of thing. And, and there's so it's not, it's not a competition. OK? 
Okay, and there's been multiple examples where Peace Corps and AID and other experts and cultures came back to us, particularly in East Africa, and mm -hmm. said, hey, you know all those wells that you're digging out there? You know, the, what you missed was the fact that you didn't go to the local tribal chief and get his overall approval or blessing for it, and that's why the locals aren't utilizing it, or that's why it was destroyed last night. So, hey guys, you know, you need to get tuned in to who the relevant actors are out there and work these projects and activities through the, the cultural systems that are in place here in East Africa. I think that um, organizations like the Peace Corps are absolute great inroads for us to establish relationships in places where we don't have them right now. And I can think of some examples in Indonesia where the Marine Corps is trying to broaden its theater security cooperation efforts and the, and the relationships with those countries just don't exist. And you just don't walk in there uh, in a uniform and, and knock on somebody's door and start having a conversation. So in that area, it's, it's, it's a great benefit and truly complimentary. Back here and then up here. Uh, yes, Carol Brookins. I was U.S. Executive Director on the Board of the World Bank from 2001 to 2005. Had the privilege of being in Iraq several times uh, during that period. Um, and thank you for many your service. Of, yeah. Many of the fine men and women who served with you. So thank you very much. Um, what I wanted to follow up with, we've had several discussions in Hamo about the development agenda. Uh, I think what you all know, what we all know, is many of these conflicts occur um, in countries that are not particularly well governed and not particularly thriving economically. So uh, I, I kind of uh, post my time at the bank classify countries as, emerge, as emerged, emerging, yet to emerge, and submerged, but um, uh, in my own private conversations. But um, I think there is a lot of metrics uh, that you may wish to use and tap into as you develop your um, strategies uh, from uh, governance indicators, uh, not just MCI here, but governance indicators, investment climate indicators, and changes in what's been happening and who are the leaders, um, poverty surveys, household poverty surveys, um, and then the bank itself and all the other development if uh, go through, uh, not always, accurately, but they go through what's called um, evaluation analysis of uh, projects, why they failed, why they succeeded. So I think there's a lot of work that can inform you in these early pre-planning uh, stages um, to understand uh, better uh, some of the challenges that the development community has not even been able to solve because there's no local ownership, the stakeholders aren't really committed to improving the lives of their people or the elites don't care or I could go on and on, but thank you again. Yeah, yes, ma'am. I think the introduction of or the inclusion of the Treasury Department at the Geographic and Bank Commands, those representatives <clears throat> has contributed to this understanding. And certainly when I was the SOC Africa commander, and we would work with different country teams, they would, they would bring in also the, the other experts, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, those from the banking interest industry that were calculating the risk to investments in, in certain African countries, had an incredible understanding of what was going on politically, socially within the, within the country that informed the the Africa command as to how much resources, you know, how much engagement, you know, would we be uh, able to achieve some of the theater security cooperation objectives that the combat command had for us. And so I, I, there's obviously more work that needs to be done there and a much more sharing, but I think it's occurring and, you know, my, my uh, HAMO team's back there taking notes to make sure we continue to incorporate that into our concept. Hi, Jen Judson with Politico. Um, there was a report that the Pentagon was late delivering to Congress a few months ago on whether it was feasible or smart to train every uniformed officer 
in a foreign language. So I'm wondering what your thoughts may be on that particular concept, whether you know, that just sort of scratches the surface, whether it's feasible. That, that's a service question. So you <laughs> you I took German in high school, does that count? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, wow. So every uniform, I, I'm not familiar with the report. Um, I think it goes without saying that uh, that skill set is um, just such a huge benefit it's, uh, to, to everything that we've been talking about here, about shaping uh, operations early, preventing conflict potentially, or at least mitigating it. Um, we, at least in the Marine Corps, that's, that is a, a core skill that we want to make sure we have enough uh, linguists, um, and not just on where we've been. Uh, and I think what we're seeing a lot of that now um, in the Pacific and in and and additionally more emphasis in, in Africa, some areas. The challenge, I'm, I'm not familiar with the report either, so there's, but the, cha the challenge is scale. Not their fault, it's late. Yeah, the <laughs> scale. You know, um, the Army trains uh, about the Marine Corps every year. Mm. Okay, in terms of induction, right? And we train and educate about 400,000 people every year. So when you think about an uh, organization of a million people, could be going down, we'll see. Uh, that's a challenge. So I come back to my point about the benefit of RAF, mm. okay? And being uh, aware, and I'm gonna try to say this, a culturalized, okay, vice culturally expert, okay. I grew up in Asia. I used to speak Thai. I may be speaking it today. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but I would, you know, so I did not speak Pashtun, and I did not speak Arabic. But my uh, comfort living in foreign countries and dealing with foreign people made me much more effective in working with my partners in both of those countries, okay? And I think for the majority of our military, <coughs> if we can achieve that, that will be uh, good enough. Not perfect, but good enough. Yeah, just to dovetail off of General Hicks's comments about scale, so SOCOM invests <coughs> millions of dollars into language training because we recognize that in order to be culturally, truly culturally tuned and experts, you got to be able to communicate in that culture and that society. And so we, we look across all our components of where we're investing language you know, funding <coughs> and resources to ensure that we're you know, utilizing this as best we can. And predominantly, it's within the, the Army Special Forces community, where this is a, an, an absolute requirement for, for our operators to, to speak a foreign language. And, but it's still a challenge for us on scale. And then the other challenges go to, you know, how, do, how do you continually reinforce their language expertise? If they're not continually immersed in the language and utilizing it, then it's you know, that, that's, that skill and that ability begins to erode. And so that, that's a continued challenge with, for us because all of the other things that we ask our operators to, to do and be qualified and, and experts in. So we continue to work very hard on that. We, we, we focus on our, our language labs. But it would be a, and I'm not familiar with the report, but it would be a significant and tremendous investment in order to try to train. And then get the, you know, be able to sustain that over an extended yeah. period of time for the officers. But I, would, I would add that we do track our officers and others who speak languages, not just in, in uh, special forces. I'm, I'm sending an uh, artilleryman to Mali right now. And he's one of two that speaks French. So it's his turn. Okay. Uh, if I could ask a question about 
what happens next with the Strategic Land Power Task Force as a, as a task force? I mean, you've now sort of evolved these two concepts. Those are going to go off and be developed. Does, is, is the SLTF's work done? Uh, does it, what's its continued role? What, how does the evolution continue? Well, we're, that's what we're going to go talk about oh, okay. when we leave yeah. here for the next hour. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm going to hold my cards to my tomorrow. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, look, there's great, from my perspective, there's great benefit in the task force. It's done fantastic work. Uh, we, we discussed the white paper earlier. There's a terms of reference that uh, was agreed to by the, the service chiefs to get this task force going. There's still some outliers in that terms of reference we're going to go talk about. Um, but uh, I, I see, you know, just fantastic results from what it's done with the, with the inception of these two concepts and the fact that they've both been accepted as a joint prospectus mm -hmm. is, is a, a, a big, big touchdown in, in the overall game that SLTF is playing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And building uh, a wider understanding here in the, uh, in the capital with the, the team we have here, uh, you know, just your move uh, alone is a... Uh, you know, significant uh, p uh, evidence of progress. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so Co SOCOM wants it to continue. I mean, the, the benefits are tremendous for us to be able to partner with, with two services uh, as a functional combatant command. So with some service-like authorities, it, it brings a tremendous weight to the, to the table when we're moving concepts forward, when we have the Army and Marine Corps right there alongside us. Mm -hmm. So we obviously the the Strategic Land Power Task Force will needs to mature and relook what the, the terms of references are and is, and so we're going to have a, a meeting shortly after this to to discuss you know, what is the. Way I didn't know goes. the answer to that question. I wasn't trying to say. <laughs> I'm not sure there is. Of course. Um, okay, so I guess my final question is for you, General. Um, I'm sure you've recognized, have you not, that working on this, thinking about this too long makes your hair fall out? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not that I want that to affect the, the no, meeting that comes a next. Hair joke. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's I just, hair joke. maybe it's time. To <coughs> I'm still cut. trying to accept the gray. Uh -huh. I worry about being yeah, bald well, later. So maybe it's time to cut this off before <laughs> it gets too far down the road. Uh, all right. Well, thank you all very much for coming this morning. Thank you for coming to talk with us. We really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you.